Allora, buonasera a tutti, ben arrivati, benvenuti. Eh, questa è una sera in cui siamo un po' emozionati perché è l'ultimo incontro del palinsesto legato alla mostra Exposure Vetrine che potete vedere in qualsiasi momento e sempre gratuitamente al piano di sopra. E legato al tema delle vetrine abbiamo raccontato con vari eh, esperti, abbiamo raccontato la tematica, le tematiche complesse, le problematiche di un museo delle culture, di un museo etnografico. Quindi in tanti episodi che sono diventati anche degli episodi podcast, vi dico perché così chi non lo sapesse può ascoltare anche gli episodi precedenti tipo l'etica dei resti umani che sarà il 3 di giugno, eh, che, che racconta l'incontro proprio con Cristina Cattaneo e eh, Guido Guerzoni e Mario Calabresi su questo tema, ma anche tutti quelli precedenti. Oggi siamo arrivati all'ultimo e l'ultimo... Ethics of Curating, eh, è in inglese, come tutti sapete, e abbiamo, perché abbiamo degli esperti davvero internazionali. Eh, questo incontro è alla fine di una giornata di workshop che abbiamo fatto e di cui come dire, siamo stati privilegiati di aver fatto questo, questo incontro e eh, io vi porto i saluti naturalmente di tutto il MUDEC perché abbiamo anche la nostra direttrice che non è qui con noi, è in California ma che comunque è online e quindi forse ci saluterà direttamente eh, ringraziandovi davvero ancora e ringraziando soprattutto i nostri ospiti della giornata faticosa ma bella e importante di oggi lascio la parola appunto e vi presento eh, Magda Gebreg Marian eh, Tesfau che è con noi stasera ma è stata anche la co-curatrice della BAMS che abbiamo fatto l'anno scorso, e della, della Black Art School eh, Modality che abbiamo fatto a Milano in una settimana di lavoro e eh, che questa sera ci sembrava la giusta chairwoman per, esatto, per mediare questo incontro con tutti voi e con Paul Basu, eh, presidente del comitato scientifico del MUDEC, nonché Um, curatore africanista del Museo Pit River di Oxford e Jonas Tinius che è insegnante alla NABA e come voi sapete perché molti di voi sono studenti suoi della NABA. Quindi grazie e passo la parola a Magda. So we had a change of plan and just to surprise uh, Bianca we decided Jonas would be the chair. Exactly. I don't think it's going to be a repetition if I introduce, if I say a few words of introduction in English um, about the reason why we're here, about the themes that we're going to discuss, and also about this day, because um, just like you said, we're here on the occasion, not just of a public panel discussion, but also on the occasion of, well, a specific encounter, an encounter between scholars, an encounter between curators, an encounter between the museum and the university as an institution, but also as this wonderful illustration behind us, it's actually more than an illustration, I think it's part of a conversation, um, shows us that was made today um, by Valeria uh, Wera Singh, um, who joined us all day today during the discussions, shows you, and I, I'll try and paraphrase, um, at some point, in the discussion, Paul um, Basu, who sits next to me, introduced all the participants of the workshop and he said, I shouldn't forget a very important set of participants, the participants that are the objects, the things, the collection around us. Um, and in some ways, this is, a, this is an early rendition um, of that mixing of objects, of spirits, of uh, individuals, of things that have undergone various, um, let's say, spheres of valuation. So we're here in some ways to reflect on what happens when a museum gets confronted with a complicated ethical decision. Um, what happens when a museum gets confronted with, in this case, um, as we discussed all day today, and we're going to expand beyond this discussion, with a collection um, of 400 objects um, from a particular collector, um, um, The collection has been called the Capra collection here. That's, this is how we discussed it, with a number of objects from varying origins and provenance. What happens when a museum is confronted with um, such an offer, um, which is not uh, seldom the case, but nonetheless with 
a collection that poses a lot of questions. Um, and I think what's been interesting just today during the workshop which we've had has been the fact that the questions that are being raised are not just, in inverted commas, about the objects, subjects, about the various items in these collections, but the questions are actually about the role of the museum, um, about museums as public institutions, but also about the relationship between private objects, private collections, the agency of collectors and curators. And then on the other hand, of course, the responsibility that public institutions have towards um, a community, towards a city, towards a broader public. So in some ways, what we're going to be discussing tonight is um, what, in fact, Paul Basu has brought into this discussion as the question of uncertainty. How do museums engage with uncertainty? How can we mobilize uncertainty over ethical questions, over the question of um, the provenance of certain objects, how we deal with objects whose provenance we don't know, um, but also a general uncertainty about the role of the museum in society. Um, and with that, of course, the role of curators, um, which is going to be the focus um, of tonight's discussion. I'm extremely thankful that I'm sitting here with two people um, that I think are most well um, Paul Basu, um, who's already been introduced, professor at the University of Oxford, um, and uh, Magda uh, Gebre Mariam Tesfau. Uh, we've had the pleasure of meeting today for the first time, but uh, we're connected through similar concerns and, and similar networks of thinking about these issues. I'm also incredibly thankful, and I'm kind of looking into the room, um, for a large number of students um, that have come from NABA. Um, NABA is, uh, of course, as many of you know, um, a university here in Milan that has a master's course for visual arts and curatorial studies. Um, and I think that the relationship between universities and museums, um, as the curator Clementine Delis would say, is one of two of the fundamental societal institutions. Um, and I would like to see that conversation continuing. And I'm very, very grateful, especially to some of you who've been here all day since 10 o'clock in the morning, and to many of you more that will join us um, also tomorrow morning. I would like to begin, perhaps, by asking you a question that might allow you also to tell us a little bit more about your trajectory into this kind of problem space, not just of questions of curating, but especially, as the theme of tonight's discussion is, about the ethics of curating. If you could tell us a little bit more individually what your investment in this question is, and maybe also your pathway or your trajectory into this discussion. And Paul, you're being handed the microphone, so I guess that means you should begin. <laughs> Great, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, hello everyone, thanks for, for, for joining us in the conversation. Um, so yes, I'm, um, I'm an anthropologist and, and a curator. Um, and just to kind of position me as, a, as it were, if that was the kind of invitation, um, I think I um, do approach this anthropologically, and I don't mean anthropology as a kind of a profession so much as a sensibility. I think I, I, I've probably been an anthropologist all my life. I mean, it's just a word, isn't it? I was, uh, but uh, I, I found a recognition in a discipline kind of identified with a, a kind of a, a, a my personal sensibilities, which is an attempt to always not be afraid of the complexity and the messiness of life but to kind of embrace it because anything else is a kind of an illusion you know we we're, so much uh, of what we do is to try and you know tell ourselves simple stories which actually if you scratch the surface turn out to be untruths or kind of myths that we we kind of live by and so that um dissatisfaction i suppose with uh, with that vivid simplicity as it's sometimes kind of been phrased um, and a, a curiosity about trying to understand something from all, di all directions, the, 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 the multiplicity of perspectives, of understandings, of ontologies, if we want to get anthropological about it, or epistemologies that converge, for example, around uh, things that we might find in, 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 a, in a museum or material culture uh, more generally. Um, so my own kind of 
engagement is to try and think of that plurality always um, and, and, and to resist the temptation to reduce. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned one of the themes, the theme of this evening, the theme of our day has been thinking about uncertainty and often uncertainty is seen as a negative thing that, uh, you know, we're uncertain about things. It brings us kind of certain kinds of anxieties and so on. Um, and that we, we, we seek to eradicate uncertainty and replace it with certainty. And this brings us kind of comfort and confidence in our, in our position. Um, and I suppose I see that also as this kind of a, um, um, an escape route from dealing with that complexity. Um, but more so the idea that actually if we just recognize and accept the uncertainty in all things, um, and don't think that we're going to, you know, our journey isn't from one of uncertainty to certainty necessarily, but we have to learn to live with uncertainty and furthermore to make it into something um, productive, something that's generative, something that's positive, uh, that, that actually is a better way to be in the world. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, but this notion of what does that mean when it comes to thinking about ethics or the space at the museum? Um, to resist this notion that it's got to be one thing, um, that it can't encompass ambiguity or complexity or plurality, that these things can, you know, contradictory things can sit together. And, and that brings us to think about the museum of the space for talking together, for processing, rather than for, you know, delivering messages, uh, delivering simple kind of lessons uh, kind of thing. It's probably a rather roundabout way of answering that. Be before we get to you, Mark, that because you've been playing devil's advocate all day, uh, Paul, I'm going to try and do the same thing, which is the ethics of curating could, of course, also be understood and has often been understood uh, through various organizations as sort of guidelines or ideas for how we conduct ourselves as curators, as museums, as scholars, um, uh, and so on and so forth. And I'm kind of curious if you could say something a little bit more about the way in which this kind of uncertainty could translate even into an ethics of curating. If usually ethics is understood as as a kind of guideline, as a as a directive for how to behave. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most in most ways in which we encounter ethics in, say, professional lives, it's something of a checklist exercise. I mean, in, in research, you know, you go, your research always goes through an ethical review and you check this, check this, check this, and you, you're suddenly, you're, you know, and similarly with museums, we have codes of practice, um, you know, a very strong one across the sectors, ICOMS, uh, code of ethics and so on. And uh, this is a guideline for, for good practice. Actually, if you ask ethicists what ethics is, this is like, no, ethics is not a checklist. Ethics is a way of thinking. Ethics is a process. Um, it's not something static that you can either be or not be. You know, it's about actually embracing the complexity. What is the right thing to do? And, um, you know, ethics, um, kind of law, uh, these kind of things are, are, are different ways of trying to ascertain what is the right and correct thing to do. And, you know, sometimes a legal, a legally correct thing is not an ethically correct thing. Uh, sometimes an ethically correct thing is not necessarily a legally correct thing. So there's, there's a complexity that needs to be kind of confronted there. Um, but yes, that notion of actually if we embrace ethics not as a code of practice with our checklist, but as a way of thinking and embracing actually, you know, plurality in that, and particularly who's involved in that conversation, you know, does the museum itself have the expertise necessarily to judge that? Does it not, you know, is it not a question that actually affects us all? We'll all bring a different perspective to the debate, as it were. And precisely that's the forum uh, that, you know, the ethical space, as it were, that indeed the museum can become, you know. Magda, I'll pass it over to you because I think that's the right transition to think you know, about the investment in the ethics of curating and your trajectory into these kind of discussions and questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, um, I don't come from the art. I graduated in political philosophy, then did my PhD in social science, um, and I work with uh, 
uh, race and anti-racism and racism and racialization. So, uh, and like the general framework, uh, if, if I have to say what kind of discipline influences me the most in this like hybrid uh, um, path that I engaged with uh, in academia, uh, those are post-colonial and decolonial studies. Um, and also like a Marxist, uh, um, a Marxist general understanding of uh, um, power relation. Um, so um, I, I'm interested in the ethics of curating. I'm interested in museums uh, because museums, uh, ethnographic museum, um, have uh, like a peculiar place uh, in the history of epistemic violence. Uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with the term, uh, but we know that mm, colonial, colonialism is just a part of coloniality. And coloniality is something that came, that, that is lingering and it's part of our, of how the world is structured today. Um, and this coloniality needs, uh, as colonialism needed, uh, um, an ideology uh, to justify and legitimate uh, its uh, hold on, on the world and its um, power of, its continuous power of structuring our lives. Um, and so uh, epistemic violence is this kind of coloniality, this kind of, uh, um, of power, uh, of violence that is exerted uh, through or against knowledge. Um, and uh, I'm interested also being a philosopher, having studied philosophy more than being a philosopher, um, I'm always been interested in knowledge and how knowledge reproduces power. Um, and so this is how I came into, into the issue. Um, at this, uh, in this moment, um, actually, we are, mm, we are facing some sort of backlash um, in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, there was a renowned interest and understanding uh, of epistemic violence. And it was also brought by like a general social movement that targeted uh, the um, the proof, the traces uh, of this epistemic violence in the urban landscape. I'm talking about all the action that also in Milan happened uh, that challenged uh, the right of statue to celebrate the colonial history. For example, we have uh, the issue with uh, the statue of Indro Montanelli in Milan, in the Giardini of Porta Venezia. <laughs> It's like a mix of Italian and English. <laughs> okay. um, and so um, when I'm also, I, I need to say this, I'm um, of Eritrean origin and Eritrea was an Italian colony. And so when we talk about like the colonial heritage in museum, always like <laughs> it knocks right <laughs> at my door um, since I am, I'm a post-colonial citizen of, of, of Italy. Um, and so I'm interested in um, the ethics uh, around these objects because I really believe uh, uh, that we need to change our epistemic framework uh, uh, in order to actually mm, be ready for an overall change uh, in the way we address uh, differences. Because uh, I'm not really I'm sorry, it's not nice to say, but I'm not really interested in diversity or differences. Uh, I'm not that anthropological in this sense. I'm interested in, in inequalities and how uh, differences turn into inequalities um, because of systems of power. Um, and so I'm interested in how these objects uh, came, come to be part of this overall uh, power structure uh, that sometimes that a lot of time ethnographic museum embody. I want to actually get back to this term that you use, epistemic violence, and um, bring in 
something that a, a, a common colleague and friend of ours uh, said just the other day, in fact, in a conversation, an interview that we've done as part of a, a series uh, within one of the curatorial studies classes, and this is the curator and philosopher Simone Frangi, um, who teaches in Grenoble at the University in France, and he spoke about epistemology not just as a form, as, as knowledge, as, as the study of what we can know, but also as an entry into forms of life. And I'd like to bring this back a little bit to you and to think about and ask you about the way in which you see museums as being invested, not just in knowledge about objects, materialities, but actually the forms of life that are associated with them. And to what extent, therefore, the representation of these objects and what we, the knowledge that we present about them is actually directly related with forms of life. Yes, I, I think this is uh, the, the I don't know if it is the main problem. It is the main problem to me. Uh, it's not really uh, the object. <laughs> like we lost a lot of things <laughs> um, as species <laughs> throughout time. Uh, and even if like some, some of these artifacts uh, are really important, uh, uh, they remain uh, in themselves some sort of objects. Uh, uh, but what it what it what gives meanings is how these objects are displayed and narrated, um, and in this sense, uh, um, I feel uh, that uh, there is uh, even to, to put some certainty <laughs> into the uncertainty. Um, whenever the other is spoken. Uh, epistemic violence happen. So um, when we want to use this object to uh, explain, to depict, to narrate a culture that we do not understand, that we do not belong to, or even we understand, we've studied it, we be, we've studied it. Um, anyway, like the power of deciding what is the story that is narrated. This, this is the colonial power. Mm. Um, so there is this author that is called Grada Quilomba. She's also an artist. Um, and she talks about coloniality saying, um, silencing is what coloniality prescribes to uh, the colonized, sub colonized subject. And she's not saying this like, like Spivak, uh, uh, Spivak is a very important post-colonial scholar um, that wrote famously uh, in this book that is called Marxism and the Interpretation of Culture, um, a piece uh, that was titled Can the Subaltern Speak? and is one of the places where actual post-colonial studies were born. Um, and she says that basically the, the colonial subject cannot speak uh, the colonized, uh, the colonized subject, and Grada Quilomba addresses this question of of Spivak and says, uh, uh, actually, the colonial subject can can speak. The problem is that it is they are actively silenced. Uh, they are not listened to, uh, and so every time I I see a narrative around objects. I always ask myself, is this reproducing this, this silencing or is this doing something else? Um, and again, not talking about certainty and uncertainty. Um, actually, it's not certain. There is this very easy, um, this easy formula to talk about decolonization that it's very hard actually to apply, but it's easy to, to understand. And this formula is, uh, Decolonization is about redistribution of power and resources. So when we came, come in contact with the objects that are colonial in, in, in themselves, in regarding of how they came to be in the museum, how can we uh, use them to, to act on this redistribution? Because if we are not doing it, uh, because Again, um, there's no middle ground to me. You're either 
actively fighting uh, against uh, uh, coloniality or you're uh, maybe unaware of doing so but reproducing reproducing it and this is uh, the very complicated matter that museums uh, ethnographic museums are dealing with now maybe i could use that question to ask a question to paul because i do think that if we consider the history of the modern european museum which of course i should maybe say of modern european museum development even though that's likewise broad as a development of institutions that on the one hand were institutions for education for showing but also institutions that developed in parallel with the purification of certain kinds of sciences um, sciences that divided the world into aspects of natural history cultural history um, that established a lot of to use that word again certain boundaries if we understand that to be part of the history of the kinds of institutions that we're talking about, then to say that uncertainty could be a principle to think through a lot of issues is quite a radical proposal. And I wonder if in some ways that's also already a response to some of the things that you've just been saying, because you mentioned that the talking about objects with certainty from, from a very specific point of view is already an act of violence and therefore to introduce the idea that maybe one doesn't actually have that Archimedean point of view from which you can talk about the whole world as if you know it, as if your own situatedness and markedness doesn't, um, as it were, influence your point of view, which of course is what uh, James Clifford so famously wrote in the introduction um, to, this, uh, to, to this book, Writing Culture, that came out in 1986, in which he said that we are forced to recognize that all kinds of writing about culture is inevitably um, a partial truth. It needs to recognize that I'm speaking from a very particular position. Anyway, to get back to the museum, I wanted then to bring this back to you, Paul, and say that is quite a radical proposal to introduce uncertainty into an institution that is so fundamentally based on the establishment of certainty. I wonder, first of all, if you agree, and secondly, what consequence? Yeah, and before that, I just couldn't resist just slightly engaging with uh, some of the things Magda is saying there as well. Um, I suppose there's another way of phrasing the question is that can the powerful, including institutions, listen? You know, so um, of course, silence can be deployed as resistance too. So it's, I think it's, it's not a, such a simple uh, question. So there's the question of listening. Um, and I think that to me, and I don't think it's a radical thing, I think it's just common sense. And it's, the, you know, if we're interested in relationships, um, that's about attending to the other, whoever that might be, you know, caring what they have to say as well as what we have to say ourselves. So there's a humility. So the radical thing is whether powerful institutions and individuals. Uh, have you know the strength enough to be humble if you like to actually say you know we don't know um, we're uncertain to come back to that um, what do you think what's your what do you bring to this table to help us together understand something and um, why, why I think it may be about objects and objects is the wrong word the stuff the things, the matter that we have, for instance, in museums, is we also need to listen to them, okay? Um, because of that history of violence, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a paradox in the anthropological, at least, process of collecting. You know, there was this dominant idea of salvage ethnography, collecting things in the late 19th century, early 20th century, when because of colonial interference in the world, indigenous ways of being were seen to be basically endangered on the brink of extinction and the irony is of course is that the colonial part of the colonial infrastructure were people who cared deeply about the loss and wanted to salvage what they could they try you know recording songs uh, collecting objects taking photographs of cultural things this is the same part of the same infrastructure that was also destroying these things um, so there's this, this again, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. It's not certainty. There were contradictions that we need to accept there. So fast forward 150 years, 100 years, and what objects 
can do is resist the narratives that we try and squash them into. So yeah, we have these dominant, uh, self-assured narratives of how to narrate things and others through things, for instance, but objects can speak back too. Okay, and to me, one of the hopeful things about the ethnographic museum in particular is that there's a trace of other ways of being in, in, in these things that you may not necessarily even find in the places that they came from because of the violence of colonialism and missionization and all of these kinds of things which have denigrated uh, those other ways of being. And oddly, in these things, there is a trace of something. And I'm not sure we know yet how to recover it, but there's something, there's a possibility there. So um, I've now forgotten the question, but I mean, I, I kind of felt that I, I wanted just to, you know, think again about that. I'm also a colonial subject in a sense or descendant of, you know, um, but I think I represent what many of us do. And that's a kind of an in-betweenness, a complex, uncertain identity. You know, I've been brought up in Britain. My father's from Calcutta, you know, his grandparents never left India. He traveled to an imperial uh, center for, for his education, you know. It's a much more messed up, mixed up, confused, diasporic world we live in, where this purity that you're invoking there is also a, a creation, you know, and it didn't just begin with European colonialism, you know, human beings have migrated and mixed and messed up things, <laughs> each other for, for throughout, and it's not only humans, of course, you know, it's a way of being. So this return to a, actually a very colonial perspective of the world divided up into you's and me's and there's a gulf between us and there's nothing that connects us and this belongs to me and that belongs to you is part of the problem and it's a and it's a creation of colonial mentality and then what we see in a lot of decolonial thought is actually an invocation of these desperately essentialized positions so i'm all for in betweenness and mess and the uncertainty of where I belong, rather than the confidence of saying, I don't belong here, I don't belong there, you know. Um, and I'm, when I see the museum, I see our responsibility as, as, as that openness to, yes, throwing away the certainties and actually accepting that, no, being in between, being uncertain uh, is actually a much more hopeful way of being in the world because it's not based on a myth, because we are all mixed up, you know, and it's the, it's the myth that has told us otherwise. You did forget my question, but you responded to it on a philosophical level, so I'm now going to take that back and, uh, and, and rephrase it a little bit, because in some ways you're also gladly disagreeing with me, and I think, um, um, you know, it's good to point out these, sometimes these differences or misunderstandings, because you're saying that we're not actually, you're saying in some ways that, um, Uncertainty is not such a radical proposal for museums because in some ways we have always been messy. We've always been uncertain to paraphrase Latour's, uh, you know, a different way of looking at this whole thing. And it's so in, therefore in that way, it's actually a more honest recognition that science, as we know, the origins of anthropology, the very forefathers of the scientific nature of anthropological work wrote themselves in the diaries they didn't want to have published how much they smoked and how confused they were and how all that clean science in some ways was always messy and dirty. And I think as soon as you look at particular objects and in some ways today's uh, workshop um, <laughs> and technology <laughs> and everything is, um, is giving us examples of how even the smallest number of objects, one single object, however certain we think we might be about that object, for instance, um, can I actually introduce a whole set of different narratives? And I think that's also one of the things that I've been wanting to bring back to both of you to talk concretely about curatorial and museum strategies. And I know that you've been invested in consideration of, you know, not thinking through the quantity of objects that we might show in a museum. And this is especially interesting because, of course, you're um, um, very close to the Pitt Rivers Museum um, for professional reasons, I suppose, um, is, is the way to phrase it, which is a museum that was based very much on the idea of comparing a quantity of, of different objects. 
And I find it quite interesting to think about different strategies to reduce the number of objects through which we tell stories and rather to multiply the stories we can tell about fewer objects um, as one possible strategy. And so I wanted to bring this back to you and, and talk about different strategies in which we can, as it were, bring to the fore this uncertainty. Yeah. Do you like? Uh, maybe, be, maybe because you didn't answer to my question in the first instance, you could just do, pick up an aspect okay. of that and then, <laughs> right. and then I have a whole set I mean, of questions for that. A museum is many things, you know, it's not just an exhibition, it's not just a store, it's not just, a, you know, it, it, it's many things. It's, it's part of a complex of institutions about knowledge production. Um, it, it, so it, we shouldn't reduce it to what we see in, a, in an exhibition. Exhibition is a tool of, you know, of, of, of engagement. Um, I mean, the Pitt Rivers Museum, yeah, I mean, you enter this and you're just in this mass of you know cluttered uh, space a very victorian space on the one hand i i see it i see i see this is the archive you know this is an archive a material archive so we don't go to the the physical the documentary archive and say you know oh just keep things that are of direct interest to the stories i want to tell now the archive is a repository it's certainly not uh, the utopian archive that includes a record of everything it's selected so and there's a whole politics of course to the archive but the point is is that the narratives are latent okay the, the you can you can select an item from the archive and tell a story about it you can select three or a hundred or a thousand and you can tell different stories and then you can put them back in the archive and let's say you know the stories we might tell of three objects a hundred years ago um, might be very different than if we take, took those same three objects today and told a different story about them. So to just say, oh, well, we should strip out the collections, you know, should be no duplication, we just, you know, uh, you, you know, this isn't forgetting the bigger picture that Magda was saying earlier about, you know, why these objects are there in the first place, but just let's say, given that they're there, um, and given that they might also be hopeful things in some senses, um, I don't see the reduction in that same way. I mean, I see the value in the archive because of the latency of what we might learn from it, you know, and that will change, you know. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think um, a lot of times uh, in this object, this stuff um, uh, is not anymore what it used to be like all the time um, and so I think it's difficult for this object to to be narrated um, and I too believe uh, that um, a museum should change um, and I don't know Paul uh, said uh, um, talking about his personal life uh, and his uh, relation, his positioning, uh, mm, uh, talked about his, his in-betweenness and his messiness, uh, right. Um, and I think uh, this is uh, something that you, this, this right to the messiness, uh, that is a right, uh, uh, is somehow something that you gain uh, and it's not just you, it's uh, what revolt, what moves around you. So, um, if we talk about the UK, we are talking about a very different context from from Italy. Uh, in the UK, there is a history of recognition of the colonial the, the colonial history that it's not the same in Italy. Um, and also mm, regarding uh, objects, um, regarding colonial heritage. Um, so. Um, with the same spirit, uh, the per mm, even if we share the same identical spirit, we would position differently in in the two different contexts. Um, and this is to say that uh, the struggle in Italy right now um, with these objects, um, of course, is a broader struggle uh, uh, that deals with urgencies uh, that have to do with the removal of the colonial history in the Italian landscape, um, and not only about this, not only the 
colonial history of Italy is removed, uh, or there is an amnesia or a selective memory, as you wish, uh, because we have different theories. Uh, but there is also, it's not recognized the role of the Italian bourgeoisie, the different Italian bourgeoisie, in uh, all the process that led to colonialism, uh, imperialism, uh, before Italy's unification. So one thing that I really appreciate of Modek uh, is the way in which they described the role of Milan in uh, like the global, the, the, the coming, uh, the, the, the making of the world, uh, globalization, etc. Because this is what you can explain. Um, the objects, uh, uh, like Mohamed Ba said at the workshop today, are dead. Uh, they are dead. He said twice. Mm. Um, but what you can tell is the, the history of the relation that you have with the object. So if museum used to be places where identity, the national identity was constructed to be celebrated, now museums can be, colonial museums, ethnographic museums can be places uh, where the national identity gets scrutinized, deconstructed, uh, criticized, where the, the, the focus is not the object, uh, but it's the relation. And uh, what you're talking about is actually you, not an imaginary other, imaginary other. Um, and I think this, this should be the process. And I appreciate uh, the idea of emptying um, the museums, not just because, uh, not, not just because the objects uh, are not there anymore. I think we could we could do a lot of things with these objects. Most of them are not legal, uh, but we can manage somehow. Um, but it's also because emptiness um, is something you can work with uh, um, to imagine something else uh, and to simply give the space for another story to be told. Um, while when we focus on retrieving something from, from objects that cannot tell, that are constitutive and certain, um, then somehow I think you are reproducing, we are reproducing, uh, um, even if we change it, we rebrand the operation, even if we have a different uh, um, motivation, we have different, at, we think we have different attitudes. In fact, we reproduce this idea of cataloging, uh, of uh, um, giving etiquette, giving uh, like um, a, a taxonomy, a place that is the colonial endeavor. Uh, this is uh, like the enlightenment uh, idea of, uh, and so I I too wish for like a change, uh, a structural change in the museums. We were saying that before when we were preparing, uh, that uh, I, I would like to see the museum change from like an institution uh, that is uh, devoted to preserve and preserve things to uh, a place. Uh, an actor of, of, of some sort of change. I wanted to give one example just because we spoke about absence as a strategy uh, in museums. In the current um, exhibitions in the Humboldt Forum in, in Berlin, especially the sections that are organized by the Ethnological Museum, there is an exhibition on Tanzania. And the curators have decided, together with um, communities of implication um, of these objects, that for every single object of the collection for which they had initially planned, uh, that, had, that they had initially planned to be part of the exhibition where the provenance could not certainly be established, there would simply be an empty space, a Leerstelle. Um, that's one way of thinking about emptiness, therefore, to provoke, to use, as it were, uncertainty as. Um, or to put it differently, to, to, to indicate, to think about uncertainty as um, through, through emptiness and through absence. But of course, the other uh, dimension that I wanted to bring in is that when we talk about the restitution of objects or the threat of the 
uh, as it was evoked sometimes in uh, you know public discourse of museums being emptied. Of course, we all know that that is not the case. We know the number of, of uh, restitution cases are extremely low, even if we're talking about um, even if we're talking about uh, museums that have been greatly concerned with this, partly because museum collections are much much larger, and of course not on the whole um, coming from context of injustice. I think that's also a very important discussion to be had, just um, to what extent the conversation about objects is actually a conversation about museums and about power and about domination. Uh, and the conversation of restitution has in some ways become a tool to think through some of these other issues. So I wanted to bring this back again, perhaps to you and to you know, discuss with you what other, as it were, strategies and ways of thinking through absence um, um, one could develop um, and how one could think through absence um, as a way to uh, think about uncertainty in the museum. So <clears throat> um, I, I thought about emptiness um, mm. um, after the um, 2020 uh, in the summer there was the whole uh, Black Lives Matter movement um, and um, like the Black Lives Matter movement, but in fact it was since 2015 from South Africa that like this uh, iconoclast, if you want to call it like that, wave uh, uh, spread throughout the West, uh, the global North. Uh, or, um, and there was this specific case that was very meaningful to me, that was uh, the statue of Edward Colston uh, in Bristol. I don't know if you know him, Edward Costell was um, uh, considered a philanthropist <laughs> uh, by the city of Bristol. Uh, in fact, he was a wealthy man that mm, was involved uh, with uh, the trafficking of humans uh, in the slavery trade. Um, and uh, he's re he, he was also mm, somebody that really participated into the mm, building of institutions in Bristol so you have a lot of things dedicated to him also he had a statue like throughout time people contested the statue they do it through art uh, they reproduced in front of the statue the preliminary of a slave ship uh, the famous uh, drawing that is uh, uh, conserved at the British Museum um, they they did several actions. They they mm, they they were not. They, their claims were not welcomed by the municipality. And I know museums are different from statues because you know from like when it's in the public sphere, in the public place, you're celebrating a history. You're not just there. It is not. Um, but um, so protester removed the statue. You have a very beautiful videos of people like tearing down the statue and throwing it into the river. Um, and the municipality of Bristol retrieved the statue that was uh, heavily marked uh, by writings and put it in the Civic Museum and put it horizontally uh, because they wanted the statue uh, to tell the story uh -huh, of what happened. Uh, and maybe they were like, uh, I would say this in Italy, un po' furbi in, <laughs> in, do, in doing so. Uh, a bit cheeky. Yeah, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, because like it's 10 years, people are dressing show people risking their lives tearing down the statue and then you put it in the museum uh, but then again uh, uh, it was interesting as a case and what they did they do is like first uh, mm, not very not very uh, I don't think it was the best choice but they decided to have an artist uh, um, reproduce the state create a statue in to honor one of the protesters of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, but then what they decided is to have moments in which like statues and other um, and sculptures and other arts are exposed in the um, where the statue was and times where the place is empty. And they wanted to use this emptiness to convey um, more meanings than a simple statue of a Black Lives Matter protester could ever convey. Um, and I found uh, 
I found I found interesting because uh, uh, because of the whole uh, strategy they adopted, but also because by doing so, it created a dialogue uh, between the public, the public landscape, the public place, uh, and the museum. Um, and somehow the museum went outside, uh, and the outside came into the museum. Um, and so I think. Uh, um, we have to understand that these processes are very site specific. Uh, what is the community saying? What are the issues at stake in the community? How the museum can be filled or emptied in order to be able uh, to collect these distances and to dialogue with them, also um, to be criticized by them and also to engage in a conversation and to me emptiness uh, is this chance uh, while uh, when you keep uh, like uh, mm, when, when you're so invested in preserving uh, this the object like it's uh, you know la roba uh, di verga um, well mm, that is um, that is deeply problematic uh, um, because somehow you're. I think my, I don't like. I don't really like like psychoanalysis, but in a certain sense, you're clinging to to the specific relation that you have with the object, and you're not naming the relation at the same time a, a lot of time. I think that's a really great example for why. Emptiness is not nothingness, but actually more absence. I think absence is such an interesting word because it literally means something that is not in a place where you expect it. Um, and I think we can use and mobilize, for example, the strategies that you've just mentioned as one of the many ways of telling a story that is not about confusion or contradiction, but actually one of multiplicity um, that at the same time is not without direction. I think that's uh, that's that's the interesting thing. I just wanted to bring in one last example because I realized, of course, that I didn't say anything about what investment I have in these discussions. But one example that my students might already be tired of, but that uh, I think is quite beautiful, is that in 2005 or 2006, um, a Norwegian artist who is called Lars Ramberg installed on the empty shell of the Palace of the Republic, which was the interim palace, we could say, a palace that was built by the GDR Republic after they uh, tore down the remains of the old uh, city castle um, and they installed this socialist palace. When that became defunct um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, this artist installed one word above this palace, the German word Zweifel, which means doubt, dubio, and essentially turned the whole ex- um, seat of government into a palace of doubt. Um, and by that he didn't mean confusion, by that he meant precisely a process of investigation, a search. And I think this is really also what you've been trying to push us to think about today during the uh, workshop, but also just tonight, that uncertainty is not an end state, it's as it were the beginning of a process. Um, it's the beginning of a process of searching for possible solutions. And I think it's it is still a courageous act, um, perhaps surprisingly, um, but it's certainly one that I think this museum is beginning to think about uh, with this collection that we discussed all day today, and that with many of you, we will discuss also tomorrow morning. Um, and I think there are many processes such as the visiting of storage and to open storage to publics that are very concrete strategies that show, as it were, the otherwise unseen sides of museums that in can introduce possible ways of thinking. I realize that time has already advanced quite significantly, and I would love to pass this microphone around and see if there are people in the room that have questions or comments, or maybe even those that were there today um, during the workshop to add reflections um, and questions. But first of all, I would like to thank both of you already so much um, for your discussion. Well,
was courage to begin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for this discussion. It was very nice, very enriching. And I wanted to ask you a question, um, especially about being someone uh, who is not necessarily only Italian, but also comes from an Italian colony. Uh, how's, how does it feel to work within the museum, you know, area, um, and what has been your greatest challenge until now to, to surpass all these problems that we've been talking about, the representativity, the anthropology issues that we've been facing? Uh, well, I, I think uh, the greatest challenge is the law, uh, because otherwise we could be very creative. Uh, with the uh, with the objects or the stuff uh, that we that we see uh, and um so um, like um, sometimes the feeling uh, like when you go in those museums that didn't act uh, on uh, like any sort of uh, uh, rebranding uh, because it's also commercial process uh, um, is uh, is the feeling of like being in a graveyard uh, um, because uh, um, like mm, it's 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 mm, I don't know if you if you if you know the Italian um, context uh, but um since uh, the late 90s uh, like this real discussion about what happened during italian colonialism was not possible like um we the government didn't acknowledge the attempted genocide uh, and a lot of the things that actually happened in ethiopia and in other italian colonies um, and so, mm, like being a post-colonial citizen in Italy is kind of a bit schizophrenic, right? Even if it's not the right word, also why? Um, meaning that uh, if you go around the city, you will find a lot of traces of, uh, of coloniality. You will have Via Ambaradam, Via Ambalaggi, via Tembien, via Lago Ashangi, via Eritrea, via Libya, and so on, right? And you will have plaques and statues uh, that commemorate the people that died in uh, Dogali, the people that died during colonial wars, and et cetera. And uh, at the same time, the general population is totally unaware of what happened. Mm. Like they had... Mm, it's not teached in school like a lot of people had grandparents uh, uh, and a lot of times the only things that they say is like huh in our family we joke around how many siblings uh, and uh, you know family we we have in the colonies and we don't know about them right um, so it's um, it's difficult to um, to witness uh, to these objects uh, uh, while uh, mm, seeing uh, the total unawareness uh, that surround the, the colonial enterprise. And I think if the social uh, situation, if like uh, the general consciousness about this were different, uh, uh, was different, uh, somehow the relation with the objects would be different the way in which these objects are displayed would be different, uh, um, and the very fact of seeing them would be different. Uh, uh, but like in this context, uh, um, the 
it's it's kind of yeah it's kind of um, a dissociation uh, no you know it's like uh, it's, you feel like you're you're a little bit maddening right um because you witness it's so clear it's so it's there you see it but at the same time it's not recognized um and so the feeling is that of being in something being around death uh in at a material but and symbolic level i don't know uh, anyway um in my i act as i talk about these things i um, i i reflect on it i read and i um, i don't know i have relationship with museums uh, uh but i'm not a curator of uh, the specific artifacts so i think uh, a lot of things uh, mi sono risparmiate yeah. <laughs> just a, yeah. a quick question since you mentioned the display i've been doing a project that is also about taking colonial the colon like exposing the colonialism within the museum display and i noticed that modek has this uh this issue with having a lot of different objects different materials from you know uh again a colonial collection but still it it still fights with inputting representation inside the museum so even though it's uh said here that for example the ethiopian wars happened and the whole uh you know the gen whole genocides happened um it still struggles to keep it outside for example the subtitles of the um, of the objects that are brought the way that are that they are put it for example you could have a gun nearby uh, an altar so um and this within this little things for example the display i think they're very important to be seen also and i wanted to know also how do you how do you feel like this can be fought you no know, because it is not only an issue of curating there as you mentioned there are also laws about it like the modic uh, cannot deal with this alone mm. um, i i believe uh, in the idea that that came up in the workshop also that there should be curatorial board that have a plurality that have uh, inside them people that is the direct hair of of the history but also experts uh, on uh, other uh, other discipline that can actually help uh, curators uh, um, deal with the complexity of of this of this object. Uh, I mean that if museums are serious about engaging uh, with uh, uh, communities and subaltern groups, uh, uh, then they have to work on processes that curators cannot uh, uh, cannot start by themselves, right? Because you need people that know how to do community work mm. so the curators are not enough uh, anymore i don't know if they ever was uh, uh, but right now dealing with these uh, you need a community because we are talking about mending the unmendable as we were saying we are talking about trying to repair the things that we can uh, and so mm, yeah, it, 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 sh it should be a communal effort. I can just add something um, about the um, different things. Uh, I was thinking about the question. Um, we, I, I'm not the curator of this exhibition, so I can speak about uh, this in particular, but I'm a curator here at the MUDEC. Uh, um, and uh, I can say that uh, we can start from another point. Without object, in the absence of object, I can say we 
can speak, we can say anything. Uh, and uh, um, so I'm not sure that uh, the point uh, about uh, empty, it could be the real uh, uh, point to start. Because uh, the status was there, the objects are here in the museum, and this is uh, the point to, to start to reflect. Without the object, uh, today our workshop, uh, it could be, um, it could be, uh, so it, uh, uh, it was uh, an occasion to have the object and to speak about that and to reflect. And uh, also the, this, is a, this is exhibition is a, one of the point of view um, about uh, some object that for a uh, long year remain in uh, the storage of the museum. So when they are not there, in the absence of the object, we didn't have any discussion about that. Now we exhibit, we, we decide, we can say, to exhibit it. Because the, the, as uh, Magda told before, uh, there is, a, of course, a lake of knowledge of, of our history. And uh, um, some objects remain in storage also because we, we the, maybe the curator didn't know how to speak about this object, how to exhibit them. Uh, so nowadays, I think that uh, um, as a museum, uh, we have this role to exhibit and to start to speak about that. Uh, and uh, I will also add another thing. This object, the um, uh, colonial object from uh, uh, Corno d'Africa, uh, are from uh, is not uh, part of the MUDEC collection. Is uh, uh, another civic museum. Even more, we decided to ask the other museum to loan, to put them in this reflection, so in this uh, um, topic. And I think that is a, um, I think that the, the MUDEC can do a lot of mistake, and of course we are doing, but the, the point that uh, um, is that we try to um, put the question, uh, and to speak about uh, it. Uh, sorry, there is Marina that is our director <laughs> that she will uh, also add uh, some. Uh, uh, no? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Can, I, I can hear an echo for some reason. Can you hear me well? Do you feel, the, do, you, do you hear the echo as well? Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Fine. Fine. Uh, okay. Th thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Magda, for talking about the public art, which in, in fact is also part of our area, because uh, this museum is under an umbrella which includes also uh, public art, and we are working on uh, the colonial. Uh, uh, presence uh, in in the cities and in the streets and in the squares um, and we are um, building up a collaboration with the communities uh, of implications but we have to consider that uh, in terms of heritage public art and museums are very much different uh, in which uh, statues sculptures uh, most often are um, copies uh, are, are uh, uh, molds um, and uh, replicable, replicable artworks, uh, while in museums you have uh, um, often single original uh, uh, artworks. And as Sarah, sorry, I can hear a terrible echo, so it's very difficult for me to talk for some reason. Um, um, but the point is, I totally agree with, uh, um, with Sarah. Without the heritage and without the objects, there wouldn't be any discussion. So if, if, you're, if you're here for this workshop, it is because we received a proposal for a donation. And this is opening up new possibilities. Also, to give up completely on the object would be to prevent future narratives for future generations. So I, I agree that emptiness has a huge potential and we have to leave space to emptiness, but we shouldn't give up on the objects because the objects are 
somewhat the medium for telling stories, which have to be different stories and new narratives. So this, of course, I agree, but uh, we cannot you know, completely give up on, uh, on the fact that, as Paul said, uh, museums are, um, are a material archives and not so much graveyards in which you know the new narratives bring vitality to the object themselves okay i i end here because it's terrible this you know echo it's we could hear you well and i think you can actually now even see us um but anyway i think there's an important distinction between emptiness and absence understood as like i said things not being in the place where you might expect them so, for example, the, the, the statue that was taken down from a pedestal, the pedestal still being there, the sculpture now being in a museum. Anyway, I think it's an interesting discussion that, of course, doesn't imply and suggest that museums should all be completely empty, but it's... Uh, Magda, did you want to add something? Just to say that emptiness um, or emptying is a process. Um, so, so we are not talking about, like, <laughs> empty room. We are talking about us being in the room with the object and dealing with them uh, and producing the emptiness. Um, so, I don't know. I I just like to also just because I feel that the conversation's gone in 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 one way. There's why diversity matters is because we need to remember that there's lots of stakeholders in this um, from all kinds of positionalities. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, I do a lot of work in West Africa dealing with issues of cultural heritage, talking about not only objects, but, you know, objects are part of a wider cosmos of things. There's not a one perspective, you know, there's not a Nigerian perspective on Nigerian things in, say, British museums or Italian museums and so on. There's not one Nigerian diasporic position there's you know so we need this goes back to my point about essentialism for some people the museum isn't a graveyard and things are not dead by any means ask a maori person if the things in the british museum from new zealand are, are, are dead and it would be like a sacrilege you know so we need to be we need to differentiate we can't talk again it's the anthropologist in me that wants to says say you could there's no general rule you know there's a mess of rules okay what's powerfully important for one person may be not important for another there's another set of issues so we have this problem okay which is whether we like diversity or not as a tool it's there we have a diverse range of opinions about things these things have different stories they're differently implicated in stories of violence. Some of them are not implicated in stories of violence at all. Some of the things we're looking at today, of course, there are. We, we can go back to the beginning of history to to, to say, you know, <laughs> when can we not talk of a context of violence of some, some kind? It's there. But I mean, if something's made, for instance, for the tourist trade and it ends up in a museum, it was intended to be purchased. It, it, it maybe the the craftsperson was very proud that their their object is now on display in a museum in in Europe. We, you know we can't we can't speak also we can't fill in the silences only with our singular opinion. We need to make sure that we reflect that diversity. You know, and I think that's very important. We're not talking about one thing. We're talking about a multiplicity of things, and that's the mess that we find ourselves in, and that we need to kind of deal with. For somebody, this is a dead thing in a in a mausoleum. In another place, it's an alive thing in a, a laboratory of thought about the future. Yes, there's one question here at the front, one at the back. Yeah, just uh, brainstorming about what you just said, Paul. It's um, I was wondering, well, what's what? How can we deal with this uh, in betweenness and with multiple perspective when uh, we think about the law, right? Because then you know this plurality of points of view, it's somehow excluded, you know. 
uh, I'm thinking about the issues of restitution and I'm thinking about how difficult this topic is nowadays and how we have policies that are state-to-state -state restitution, state-to-community restitution, and, you know, it, I embrace completely your anthropological perspective, but then when we go to issues of restitution and when the law is involved, how do we deal with that? The other one's already in the back. I mean, specifically on, on, on law, I mean, and I'm not a legal expert, but um, my understanding is that, you know, because actually law is all about, w w the law as written provides, is certain, you know, but when law is applied, it's uncertain, which is why we have juries. So a, a jury, the, the principle is that we should be uncertain, isn't it? We we should, you know, until proven guilty kind of thing. But the proven guilty is a peculiar process because you have people advocating for positions and it's about telling stories and convincing people who are supposedly have no investment in the outcome. It's a very imperfect way of getting at truth. You know, so true. Tr you know, this this is the this is the problem. Is law a, t a perfect tool? I, I'm sure no lawyer would say it, it is. You know, just like ethics, it's a process, and it's the kind of thing when we you know come up with different systems. How do we arrive at consensus of some kind? You know, and that every option has a problem, but you know we struggle and we try and refine processes and so on. So, you know, I don't think law is as certain as as we as we think it is, you know, because I mean, it's 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 in that very structure there. So, to to, to me, it's about you know the, 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 the I I think we need to make a distinction about what is what is it that makes the the museum not a university, not a public space, uh, an empty public space, a theatre, let's say. Because, you know, is there something distinctive about this institution? And for many people, that would be because it has collections. You know, otherwise it's an exhibition hall, you know, or, a, or as I say, a theatre or another kind of a forum. So there's something that gives it that distinctiveness. Um, I now lost my tra train of thought on that one. But um, yeah, this notion of a forum, I suppose, is what I'm coming back to, an ethics as a forum of, of bringing together a diverse range of voices. We don't speak with one voice. Sometimes the person with the loudest voice says they speak, you know, for a group, you know, which they may or may not do. But if 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 we engineered the forum around whatever topic it might be, you know, not only about the status of these objects in an institution called a museum, but there are many other things that we could connect to with the collections in a museum, for instance um it's that's the idea ethics as forum the museum as forum we've got enough problems in the world and if we were you know to, to go back to that idea of pursuing a pedagogy of listening to each other to things to the environment to you know then maybe we would be in a better position to you know reflect on all of that it's too easy to say and the solution is dot 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 you know, because it, it's we live in a very complex world, and we always have done. And, and yet, if I could just say, or maybe maybe I shouldn't, whatever. Um, no, okay. There was a question at the at the back. Buonasera. I try to explain in English. I try to explain me in English. Um, Go ahead, Italian, you? We we can also translate if you prefer. Okay. Um, io penso che avete già parlato assolutamente delle, della restituzione dal punto di vista della diaspora e delle comunità che abitano e soprattutto per la quale è stato creato questo museo. Credo che sono importanti gli oggetti che può essere il punto di partenza ma deve essere sempre legato alla vita che questi oggetti seguivo, anche il commento di Zara. Noi a, al museo credo che queste sono le attività legate agli oggetti che più abbiamo fatto da quando questo museo è stato creato. Restituire a, alle comunità, diciamo anche a, alla parte più importante, anche agli artisti, agli studiosi, agli studenti, ma soprattutto per esempio ricordo per un, 
do un esempio perché si capisca quello che voglio dire, con la collezione africana che abbiamo noi nel museo, abbiamo fatto delle attività con degli artisti per parlare di questi oggetti, queste statue che fanno parte della vita rituale dell'Africa. E, e questi artisti in alcuni momenti hanno uh, dato dei suggerimenti secondo quello che, queste, che questi oggetti significano, come devono essere esposti, come devono essere venerati, perché per loro fa parte de, della loro storia, del loro contributo, della loro eredità culturale. E credo che questo debba essere anche un punto di partenza parallelo per parlare degli oggetti che sono oltre la vetrina e della etica del curatore. Scusate che ho dovuto dirlo in italiano. Was it a, was it a question or a... Yeah, okay, thank, th thank you. I mean, I don't know if it's a question for me, for me or for Magdor, but um, my sense is that uh, many museums do involve um, diasporic. In fact, they tend to involve diasporic uh, communities and artists and so on, partly because of the cost involved in, in doing otherwise. You know, so actually, the go usually a museum will go to the community who reflects perhaps the, you know, it's also problematic because it says, you know, can I just approach it from a slightly different point of view? As someone of part her Indian heritage, you know, the museum's default position will be to come to me for expertise about Indian objects. You know, I know nothing about Indian objects. You know, I've spent most of my career engaging with West African objects. So there's this assumption, right, you have a, you know, somehow my DNA gives me a right or an ability to talk about things. This is a crazy thing, okay, but this is what happens all the time. Okay, oh, you're of Nigerian heritage, you must be an expert about our Nigerian collections. Well, no, you might be, but you might not be. So I, I think what, I'm try, what I've been trying to say is that we should de-essentialize our ideas of identity, you know, accept the mixed upness of us all, you know. So much of this is about identity politics, you know, and, and, and you know, part of a strategy of asserting, you know, perhaps uh, resisting other people's definitions of us is to, you know, take power of that and assert that. But it often what happens is you end up, uh, one ends up reasserting the ascribed identity, you know. Whereas if we could just free ourselves from the kind of, you know, shackle of this essentialist way of thinking about ourselves, uh, maybe we'd be, you know, actually more truthful in a way, you know. Who is not mixed, you know. And yet what we keep doing is positioning. This is an African object. This is an Igbo object. This is the, from this, ta you know, and, and so on and so forth. This constant desire to compartmentalize, to categorize, to typologize. And this is absolutely what co the colonial purification of things that uh, Jonas was asking that question about. It's more radical to say to hell with all of that. You know, let's go back to, uh, you know, the fluidity of these categories and so on. You know, it wasn't until this kind of, as you said, you invoked the birth of the modern museum with the so-called enlightenment, which indeed separated culture from nature, this species from that species and so on. You know, we've created the boundaries. OK, this is the colonialism and actually this is the epistemic violence, you know. So, yes, everyone should be able to, in, in theory, have something to say and engage and to, 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 to participate in the curation, let's say, of things, you know. Uh, it, 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 the next level of complexity comes where someone asserts, no, you have no right to do that. That belongs to our culture, uh, you know, and that then opens up the next. Well, just to keep 
like doing this thing that we're doing. <laughs> Um, it's, I, I totally agree with Paul uh, about essentialism as a threat uh, um, and um, as essentialism as the continuation of a colonial mentality. Um, but at the same time, I think maybe it's because the, the question is, was in Italian. Um, there is, uh, it's important to address the difference between uh, uh, stakeholders uh, like communities and uh, experts. Uh, so not every Nigerian person, uh, like maybe very few Nigerian person are experts of Nigerian art. But at the same time, maybe all of the Nigerian person uh, that are in Milan today have less access <laughs> to um, a culture that they can claim as part of their history, but they cannot claim as much because uh, there's no trace of it. Uh, and part, uh, and like these uh, marginalization of uh, histories uh, uh, that pertain to Baltern, uh, historically um, marginalized community and, and nationalities and former colonial subject, et cetera. Um, it's something that really um, prevent uh, like uh, an evolving sense of self uh, and like also the understanding that the, the, this process of the essentialization uh, uh, needs uh, to also include uh, this knowledge of uh, of an history that you can call ancestral, right? So um, I don't know if I made myself clear, uh, but I think uh, a community involvement uh, is uh, central, and, and I think that the word community is, uh, is problematic when we talk about uh, like people that belong to like a same nationality of origin. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's not that like depriving uh, uh, like, like not 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 doing the effort of trying to uh, include in the conversation uh, the hairs of the specific history uh, don't 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 have a positive outcome at the end of the day. I don't know. I I wasn't clear. Thank you. I I do want to broaden this out and actually just point in conclusion to another danger, which which is of course to say that there are certain problems that pertain to certain communities, which of course is another word that if you go across languages also, since we're translating here between Italian and English, if you translate it into the German context, Gemeinschaft versus Gesellschaft has again very different kinds of connotations of ethnic homogeneity and so on. So I think we have to be very careful when we assign responsibility. Um, and so as it were, by concluding, I would just like to emphasize again the fact that one can be and this is a point that Michael Rothberg makes about memory. We haven't brought in discussions about multidirectional memory tonight because, of course, then we would be here until tomorrow morning. But that one can be implicated, folded into, concerned by or concerned with certain kinds of issues without being in some essentialized form connected to um, an object, a problem. And I think that's why the concerns that we're talking about nowadays, be it restitution, be it in inverted commas, decolonization, be it a critical engagement with museums and collections, be it provenance research. These are questions that, that in some way or form concern all of us. Um, and you can begin to think of a museum, especially a public municipal museum, as an institution that is in so many ways tied to, um, you know, the citizens, tied to schools, tied to various forms of communities of implication. Uh, and so I think it's really important to open this up more broadly and really multiply, as it were, the responsibility. Um, and that brings it back to all of you, um, whom I would like to thank for being here with us um, until I don't even know what time it is. Also, I don't know if Marina's still there, but um, yes, greetings to her. And thanks, of course, especially also to Mudek for hosting us all day so wonderfully um, and for well, providing the space to have this discussion. Thank you so much.